Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're still expecting a lot more people, but we'll, um, I think we'll kick off. Um, my name is Alan Ryan. I'm, I'm the Public Sector Program Manager in SAI. Um, and this afternoon's session is about all the public sector targets that have been set recently and how some public bodies are planning to achieve them. Um, and also get into the depth of the methodology a little bit as well, so you understand how it's calculated. Um, so I'm the running order for this afternoon is I'm going to speak, then um, Lee McCleary is going to give you a more in-depth overview of the, how the methodology works, how the, um, how the targets are being set for the greenhouse gases. Uh, and then we will have a, a little bit of a transition then to the, uh, the second session, which will be about capital projects uh, and, and other project works that are happening. Orla Kyle, my colleague in SEI, will speak about capital projects uh, and capital supports within SEI, especially the Pathfinder program, which is a 100 million euro program over the next uh, two to three years for uh, deep retrofit of public sector buildings and demonstrating approaches. And then uh, two presentations from public bodies, the Department of Schools and from the HSE. Uh, so we'll, I'll kick off with my own. Um, which is really just an overview of, of the targets and an introduction, brief introduction to the monitoring reporting system that public bodies use every year uh, to report their energy performance. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, um, sorry, I'm looking back here now, uh, the, the different programs. Well, the two main programs that are in SEI at the moment supporting public bodies, uh, policy and targets, the monitoring reporting system itself, how it works a little bit. Some of the 2021 results which will lead then into what Liam is going to talk about, how the targets are set, and then talk about uh, uh, an enhancement we're doing to the MNR 2030 system, which is what public bodies report on, gearing it up for the next 10 years. So there's two programs uh, supporting, directly supporting public bodies, uh, dedicated supporting public bodies in SEI. So this is aside from all the other um, programs, uh, the C grant scheme, the Better Energy Communities, public bodies can all avail of them, but these are dedicated to uh, particular targets within the public sector. So there's my own program, which is uh, the public sector program itself, which is about embedding good energy management practices and leadership within the sector. So that's advanced substantially over the last number of years, and we have different different um, sectors like the local authorities and the CCMA, City and County Managers Association, different uh, leadership engage in that. And that's uh, very uh, positive. Then we help them plan strategically and do assessments and run the data and look at pathways towards 2030. We're gonna be enhancing those supports over the next few months. And then of course, there's a, a program place to monitor how they're performing. Um, for those of you who are interested, we've just issued a tender um, for up to about a, a just over 11 million over the next four years for advisory supports for public bodies across six different lots. So if you're, if you're interested in helping public bodies, please have a look at that. And then the Pathfinder program, which is Earl's program, has uh, about 33 million a year for the next three years, investing in deep retrofit solutions for public bodies and decarbonized solutions. And we'll hear some of the examples of how that's working, trying to mobilize projects and large scale initiatives in the public sector, because these targets are pretty ambitious. Um, the, this is the, the policy landscape and the legislative landscape that's coming on the line. So up to 2020, these were Ireland's, or this was Europe's specific targets. And these were translated into Ireland through what you might realize are called uh, NEEPS, National Energy Efficiency Action Plans, and then they became NCPs, National Energy Climate Plans. So these will be submitting every year. And these were the targets for the public sector specifically, a 33% energy efficiency performance improvement, which we won't talk specifically about today. These are the ones for 2030. So you can see the acceleration for the public sector. And then out to 2030, we're looking at uh, climate neutral for the EU and net zero is what's stated in the Irish Climate Action Plan. Uh, these uh, are pretty ambitious. So 50% uh, energy efficiency improvement up from 33%. This is interesting, which will form most of our discussions in the first part. 51% absolute decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. That's energy related greenhouse gas emissions. So if the public body is using 100 tonnes of CO2 uh, energy related 
uh, in its baseline year, that needs to be 50 by 2030. So it's absolute, it's a budget. No matter how many new hospitals you build, how many uh, schools, um, you still have the same amount of carbon to operate within. And you will see how that target is set up. It can, it's gonna be quite challenging. Um, this was introduced in the Climate Action Plan recently, 50% of space heating and buildings to be renewable. And there's still an ambition, it wasn't original cap, uh, it's not in the, the latest one, but there's still an ambition that we want to retrofit all public sector buildings, all 12 and a half thousand of them, to a high energy rating. And there's, there's other drivers coming that will accelerate that. That's still in our national development long-term strategy. These are the European ones. And I don't know if you noticed in the news because of the, what's happening in Ukraine and energy costs, they're thinking of increasing these, especially this one up to 36 or 39%. So this is a real movable feast, this one up here. But I just draw your attention to this, these recasts. So these are the uh, directives that the EU enforces these targets. There's the Energy Efficiency Directive, there's the Energy Performance Buildings Directive, and then there's the Renewable Energy Directive. This, you may know, has resulted in the Bear Scheme in Ireland and, um, and other initiatives regarding buildings and building ratings. The energy efficiency design is what's responsible for the requirement for enterprises needing to do energy audits for the energy supplier obligation scheme. That's what's driving them. And the recast of that, which is going to come out in the next two to three years, it's saying there has to be a 1.7% absolute reduction in kilowatt hours in the public sector. So if you're using 100 kilowatt hours in your baseline year, the next year that needs to be 983 the following year it needs to be blah 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 so it's an annual target of 1.7 percent and it's a perpetuity so it's just going to keep on going so that's a huge target especially where we're going to be building new hospitals etc this three percent floor area to nearly zero zero every year that is that three percent of the floor area of public sector buildings has to be renovated uh, retrofitted to nearly zero energy um by 2030 or, or sorry a, a year again forever so that could be quite uh, cumbersome on on some public bodies that have a lot of building stock and if for those who in, in the know the epbd is recasting will result in the recast of the bear scale so uh, orla might talk a little bit about it later she knows more about it but in, in theory for what's what's currently an a in five or six years time will now be a b um, what's uh, an F will now become a G. So roughly equates to that. So that's bringing 3% of floor area up kind of like A++ based on the current scale. So it, it's very ambitious. And you can imagine uh, for the HEC with millions of meters squared, that's going to be owners. And then the renewable directive stipulates, well, what is renewable? So if you use district heating, is it renewable to declare that district heating supplied from the waste heat from a data center is zero CO2? They, this is the, the directive will determine and those factors will be put within our, in our system. So you can see uh, we're pretty clear what we need to do and we're getting on with it. But up here, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty and uh, with the current climate, we, we anticipate, you know, some countries are saying these are too onerous and too hard. We anticipate they're not going to go away and they could, get, they could get higher. So that's the landscape. Every year, public bodies report to SCI. Uh, there's 350 odd public bodies. It varies a little bit every year. 99% compliance rate. We think we factored all the energy consumption. Um, about 76% of schools report. And this ranges from the HSE down to uh, an office with three people in it. So it's every public body. And uh, congratulations to the public sector. They achieved their 33% by 2020. So that has to be uh, recognized. Um, of course, COVID had absolutely no, um, um, had no effect on that. I, well, you know it had an effect. For some, it had a really bad effect on their performance, and some it had a really good effect. But um, it did have an effect, but we think it might have evened itself out. We can't really determine. But the public sector has achieved the target, which is, which is positive. And there has been an awful lot of effort over the 10 years for the public sector to achieve that. So congratulations to them. Um, in, in a quick overview of the system, we get the meter points or the meter numbers or uh, labels from the public bodies. And then we go out to the meter operator and they give us the data back. So if we say here's electricity meter, non-quarterly hour or quarterly hour, then they give us different amounts of information depending on whether it's quarterly hour or non-quarterly hour meter. And then the gas, get one uh, annual data for each gas meter. And we populate 
the system with uh, actual energy usage for gas and actual energy use for electricity, and then report one number for LPG, one number for oil. So the HSE reports one number for all the oil they consume. So there's about 50,000 meters on the system at the moment. Uh, as I was saying, 350 organizations, uh, around 37, 3,800 schools. So it's, it's catering for a lot of, lot of inputs. Uh, and at the moment, those meters aren't linked to uh, a particular asset. So they're just meters that are on the system. And we categorize them and they can see what the biggest ones are, but they're not linked to a specific building or the performance of a building yet. Um, and this, this is just some of the graphs that come out annually every year. Um, relevant to what Liam will present, you'll go into a bit detail. But this is the, uh, C the energy related CO2 emissions for the last number of years. Uh, the proposed baseline, well, no, it is the baseline within the Climate Action Plan for the target is 2016 to 2018 average, which for these years was that. Um, and uh, you can see the general trend as emissions are going down. So. And the reason for that is the electricity factor, um, mostly. Uh, so the energy consumption is getting is mostly the same, the amount of total final kilowatt hours that we're using. But because we're more efficient, we're supplying more people, we're providing more services, where the energy management that's happening is, is preventing uh, rises in, in actual consumption. So we're, we're just fighting to stay still, really. Um, but the emissions are going down because the grid is decarbonizing. Um, and uh, it, when we were setting the, well, when government were setting the greenhouse gas target for public bodies, they had to be cognizant of this, of this electricity effect, because if you set it just on the fossil fuels, then you don't uh, incentivize people to do PV and other electrical projects um, to get that gain. So it took a bit of time to set the target. So it considered electricity, but it also focused mostly on, on these fossil fuel uses. And that's where this one is interesting because this shows the fossil fuel usage in, in, in leased and, uh, and owned buildings. So public, the m and doesn't have a scope one or a scope two or a scope three concept. It just says uh, if your direct fossil fuel use or in, in leased and, and owned buildings, um, it, it adds them all up. It doesn't factor in uh, or separate them out. It's all attributable to the public sector. And this is the baseline for those years. And you can see it's hardly moved. So even though we're using um, more services, et cetera, we're fighting to stay still. So we are succeeding in reducing consumption while reducing the amount of avoided usage. It's still, this needs to be cut by 50% over the next eight years. And it hasn't changed really in the last eight. So it's gonna be a, a pretty tough, tough ask, tough task. And you can see where the major users are. Gas, obviously very relevant nowadays, and uh, transport fuels. So it's gonna be, um, it's, it's a strong target and it's absolute. So there's no um, um, allowance for offsets. There's no allowance for uh, uh, um, uh, PPAs, not yet. That needs to be determined. So it's, it's gonna be an owner's target. Um, public buildings are 50% of our 54 percent of the co2 emissions in the public sector the rest being transport public lighting uh, etc so buildings are a big target area um, and that needs to be tackled um, this just shows how we're developing the monitoring reporting system over the next few years so this is the this is a normal mnr cycle and uh it it shows you how we report every year. We get the data, we send it off the meter operator. They enter in all the other energy data. We check it every year through a data verification assessment. And then we uh, do analysis and we issue the report. It's a normal cycle. This year, we're adding business travel. So public bodies are going to have to report on their business travel, flights, rail, etc. We're adding the concept of a, 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 um, a building register. Uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later. This is a pilot we're doing this year. Um, and this is uh, the Clean Vehicle Directive, tracking what vehicles public bodies procure. So we're trialing that this year. So two pilots this year, and then business travel is mandatory. And at the same time that that's going on, we're building a new and MNR system. So the current system is about eight years old. This will set it up for the next 10. And we'll be coming out to public bodies very soon with user groups and user experience things. So that's 
the reporting system between the old and the new. And we have very relevant thing for this audience is we're we're looking at a, um, a building registry. Again, this year we're going to pilot it. Um, we have a, a separate system doing that for the moment. And that's just using existing data that's in the MNR and saying this meter is attributable to this building along with this gas meter. And they're able to track just using annual MNR data um, on the system. Next year, it'll be mandatory and you'll be asking for more stuff. And then there's an enhancement program to come. Um, here's some of the information we're going to be asking for. So these are some mandatory stuff we're going to be asking for. The most important is total flow area, get, trying to get that right. And then do you have a bar to start planning this retrofit program? And then you have a deck. Quick hands up, many of you have heard of, of decks. About, about 20 to 30%. So display energy certificates, public bodies are supposed to publish them every year. It's a marker of how, uh, of actual performance of a building. Uh, track what public bodies have them and need them. So this is the pilot system we're using, a kind of a, an overview of the graphs that are possible. And uh, you can see the impact of COVID on this particular building. Um, and this is just annual data that we're getting from the electricity meter operator. This is 36 points uh, monthly data. And uh, it just this is data that hasn't, some public bodies wouldn't be getting at all. And some, if you were there this morning, you would have seen Michael Curran's presentation. They're very sophisticated MT systems. This is just um, a simple MT MNR data. Uh, we're going to try and help them plan where their biggest users are for this local authority. Leisure center is the biggest user, then followed by a couple of office buildings. So if you're, if you want to, if we're helping them plan and strategize for the future, they got to be tackling these buildings. So that's ho hopefully what the building register will help them form that planning going forward. Um, and then very quickly, um, our plan for the next number of years. So we, we do want to get more meter data from the meter operator, hopefully when smart meters comes up, which will enable us to do more granular analysis. Um, and also public bodies input their own meters and take data feeds in from the marketplace, et cetera. Um, we want to be able to do more at asset level. So this is a huge ambition talking this morning about the actual performance of buildings. It's a big bugbear of mine. I don't care if you've got an air rated building, um, how much kilowatt hours is it using? Because that's what you're going to be measured on in, in the years to come. How much carbon is it actually emitting and how much kilowatt hours is it using? I don't care what it's rated at or if it has BREAM or if it has anything. That's so being able to have better ways of saying, and, and Rachel the, said it this morning, what is good performance? Being able to declare that to public bodies. Wider carbon footprint and uh, monitoring and linking in with other protocol, protocols. Lots of us report emissions different ways. So we should be able to take that data from MNR and spit it out to different reports. Um, uh, better measurement and verification of projects because we need to be able to validate data. Um, more data on vehicle ownership within the public bodies, um, more advanced in that analysis to be able to uh, plan and pathways to 2030 and 2050, um, more advanced reports to go to leadership and to different people as to what's, how they're performing, where their biggest users are, where there's exceptions. And then, um, you know, there's other stuff that are hanging around there for, for a long while, uh, green public procurement, um, maybe perhaps extended into the private sector. So there's a pretty ambitious build plan um, for the next number of years. You can get a flavor of what's coming along. That's just a whistle stop tour. Um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Liam at this stage, and then we'll take questions after Liam, if that's okay. Uh, and hopefully it'll all make sense now a little bit more when he talks through the targets. Liam. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Good afternoon, uh, Liam O'Clary from Burn O'Clary uh, here talking today on behalf of SCAI. Um, and really what I'm going to talk about is two things today. One is how the greenhouse gas target for the public sector for 2030 is structured. Um, and then talk a bit about the pathways at a very high level that public bodies can follow or seek to follow to, to, uh, to decarbonize their, their energy, you know, looking out to 2030 and then beyond to, to 2050 as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about the energy efficiency target for 2030 here today, um, but just bear in mind, as Alan has, has introduced, that, that is the other target for 2030. Um, but probably most of you are quite familiar with that as it, as it uh, continues the approach that was used here to fall for the 2020 target. So, um, the, uh, 
we have a few principles here just for establishing the, the, the 2030 greenhouse gas target. The first is we're very much talking about energy related emissions here in, in the context of the target. Uh, you know, we will perhaps look at reporting non-energy emissions in due course, but the target is very much focused on energy related emissions. It's all energy use effectively, you know, electricity, fuels for heating, fuels for transport and so forth, use for equipment, lighting, everything. It's all our energy consumption. It's an absolute emissions target expressed in tons, and Alan's, Alan's mentioned that, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail now, but it's absolute emissions in tons. Um, it's measured from a 2016 to 2018 baseline, as is set out in the, in the Climate Action Plan. And it's based on a 51% reduction in our transport and thermal uh, re energy related emissions. And also on a reduction in energy emissions that's in line with supply side decarbonisation. Bit of a mouthful there. Um, the four principles on the, on the left, you know, it's energy related, it's all our energy, it's absolute emissions, and there's a clear baseline. They are very challenging, but they're fairly straightforward to understand. The bits on the right hand side are a bit more complicated, and we'll talk about how the reduction, that, you know, how the target's calculated, and this bit about electricity supply side decarbonisation. So I'm going to talk, spend most of my talk, talk focusing on the bits on the right hand side because they're just that bit more complicated. Um, and I'll start with a slide that's very similar to one of the ones that Alan puts up there, and this shows the direct energy-related emissions from the public sector over the last decade or so from transport and thermal. So the energy used in our vehicles, and the energy used to heat our buildings mainly, and then other bits and pieces of heating that we use in the public sector. And if you just take one thing today from my presentation, it's that this is flat. It's a thousand kilotons kilotons to units, 1,000 kilotons of emissions, and despite all the good work we've done over the last decade, it's flat. So effectively, whilst the public sector has done really well in terms of energy efficiency, and I'm doing more with less, or perhaps doing more with the same effectively amount of energy, and we've done a, few, a little bit of switching to renewables, a little bit of fuel switching maybe from oil to gas and things like that, the bottom line is flat emissions from thermal and transport over the last decade when we aggregate them up to public sector level. And this is in the context of having to cut it in half. I'm going to explain a lot of complication about how we calculate you know, this emission, you know, this 51% reduction. But bottom line is we've got to cut this in half. And we've, we've, we've struggled to do that over the last decade. When we layer electricity onto it. It's a little bit uh, more nuanced. Uh, the first thing to say is electricity accounts for about the same amount of emissions again. <coughs> but it's fluctuated more over time. Um, as Alan has mentioned, that's really down to the fact that the electricity system has become cleaner. We have less oil, um, less coal, less peat, more renewables on our electricity network, so less carbon emissions per unit of electricity consumption. If we look at final electricity consumption in the public sector, it was actually flat all the way up to 2019. Uh, there was a drop in 2020, almost certainly uh, arising from COVID. So that trend downwards is predominantly because our grid, electricity grid has gotten cleaner. And in fact, it, it's become almost, it, it, it's become 47%, almost 50% cleaner over the period shown there in terms of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, per unit of electricity. And the public sector has, has gained from that as all uh, energy users have. Now, um, as Alan said, uh, the baseline is 2016 to 2018, and very roughly, that works out about 2,000 kilotons when we add up all the emissions across the public sector together. And we just have round numbers here today. Um, and that's, that's our baseline. What the blue line shows is what would happen if the public sector froze at its baseline period in terms of its energy consumption. But we know the electricity network is going to get cleaner. It's going to decarbonize as Ireland hopefully achieves its what was a 70% renewable electricity target by 2030 and is now going to be an 80% renewable electricity target by 2030. So if we achieve those targets on electricity and the public sector did nothing other than staying where it was at its baseline, this is where we think it would end up in terms of emissions. Because we think the electricity network is going to decarbonize by about 67%, 70% or 70% between the baseline and 2030. So that works out in rough numbers about a 700 kiloton reduction for the public sector. And we call that the supply side gain because the public sector would just have to stand still to achieve that. Not an easy thing to stand still, by the way, in terms of not using more energy, but if it did, that, that emissions would drop by, by that amount. So 
clearly the target has to be set a good deal below where we think the public sector would get to anyway. And that's why we have this rather slightly complicated way of expressing the target. So um, this is where the target's set here. I'm going to explain in, a, in another slide or two exactly how we calculate it, but more just focus a couple of, uh, a couple of points on it. Uh, the first thing is here, is there's plural there, targets. And effectively, there are two targets for the public sector and indeed for each public body. The first is a total emissions target. In the, the context of public sector, that's about 800 kilotons. But also a target for the emissions, the direct emissions from the burning our oil and our gas in our transport and thermal. So we're separating out those direct emissions from our totals, which also includes electricity. The second important point is, before we get into the detail of it, it's a big reduction, no matter what you measure it against. If you measure it against the baseline of 2,000 kilotons, it's a big reduction. If you measure it against 2020, it's a big reduction. If you measure it against where we think we're going to be in 2030, it's a big reduction. And if you just look at the 500 kilotons on the, on the right there of our direct emissions, it's a big reduction from the 1,000 we've been at for the last decade on our direct emissions. Okay. So we could spend a lot of time talking about the ins and outs of how we calculate 51%. It's a big cut. And that's, you know, I think most people have got their heads around that at this stage. Um, but it's, 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 this is not a sort of incremental change that we're, that's required. This is a big step change in performance. So the gap there is about 500 kilotons, and we, we use the term it's a reduction required from own action. Public bodies have to make those savings by themselves. They're, they can't rely on the electricity grid to deliver those savings for them. So for the remainder of my presentation, I'm going to talk about two things. One is um, how we calculate the target at the public body level, and then two is sort of the pathways that exist for the public sector to achieve that 500 kiloton reduction, the pink arrow there. So I'm going to explain the target set setting methodology first in the context of an individual public body, because there will be a target for every public body, and they then aggregate up into public sector um, um, level target. And everything that's gone before in terms of principles I explained about electricity supply side decarbonization and all that stuff in the context of the public sector, that trickles down to individual public bodies. But let's consider we have a public body here with a baseline of 300, 300 tons of emissions. And for simplicity, we'll assume that its emissions are split a third, a third, a third between thermal, transport and electricity. So it's two thirds direct uh, energy related emissions and one third um, electricity. So we know the target is a 51% reduction in emissions from thermal and transport and a reduction in electricity emissions in line with supply side decarbonization. So how does that work for this hypothetical public body? Well, let's, let's work through it. We look at the thermal. 51% reduction in the uh, thermal emissions for this public body. 51% of its baseline of 100 leaves us with 49. Same for transport. 51% reduction from its baseline of 100 leaves us with 49. Electricity, if you remember I said the, we think the electricity system is going to decarbonize by about 67% between the baseline and 2030, based on SEAI's modeling. So 67% reduction on the electricity emissions brings us from 100 down to 33. We bring all them together, and this is this public body's target for 2030. So its target is expressed as an absolute quantity of emissions that it can emit at 2030. Reach if, 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 if it emits uh, a quantity below that target or at that target it's achieved it. If it's above it, it hasn't. <coughs> so you can see again, if we add them up into totals, we're adding them into two totals here. Add them together, it's 131 tonnes for this public body for its total emissions target and its direct emissions target. So its emissions from transport and thermal added together are 98 tons. So a couple of points just to delve into this a little bit deeper. The first is to say that a public body's absolute emissions target will be dependent on the makeup of its baseline. I'm not going to get into more examples here, um, but suffice to say if a, another public body that had emitted 300 tons at its baseline, but if it was more weighted towards electricity or less weighted towards electricity, when you apply the methodology I've worked through there, you'll get a different number than 131 tons. <laughs> okay. So it's the approach that 
So that's why we've structured it this way, is that we want a 51% reduction in, in the direct emissions and then we let uh, a reduction in electricity that tracks the grid decarbonisation. So that's the first point. And the second says that public bodies have some flexibility in terms of how they achieve the target, but only some. And the idea of the two targets is, is important. So for this public body here, its target there is on the right-hand side. And if in 2030 it had emissions exactly as per the, the, the bar second from the right, it would have come in at bang on 98 tonnes of direct emissions and 131 tonnes of electricity emissions, and it's met both of its targets. An alternative scenario where the same public body maybe decarbonised more of its uh, thermal, more of its heating, and you know, electrified more of its heating, so reduce its heating consumption emissions uh, further, but maybe didn't do so well on transport, but increased its electricity. You can see this, this situation here, where it still achieves both targets. The sum of thermal and transport is below 98, and the sum of thermal, transport, and electricity is bang on 131. So that's okay. <laughs> but consider the same public body maybe that you know, struggled to decarbonize its transport and um, only went so far with its heating, and, um, but went further with its electricity. Still, it reached, it, it came out at 131 tons by 2030, but you can see the sum of thermal and transport are higher than the direct emissions target. So it would not be deemed to have met both of its targets. So these are, these are uh, some uh, uh, you know, important details um, and it's, we have uh, we, we, you know, we've various tools and we'll be publishing more guidance in terms of exactly how this uh, calculation applies to different public bodies but the, the, the core principles of it are there. So moving on to um, how public bodies can, can you know, look to, to, to bridge the gap to their targets. And you know, decarbonisation pathway, there are three main high level elements to this. The first is use less, okay? <laughs> so for almost all public bodies, this means using less energy in our buildings, for our heating, for our lighting. It means using less energy for uh, ICT, <laughs> using energy efficient equipment. And for most public bodies who also have an at least some element of transport, it means using less <laughs> for transport, you know, switching to active mobility, uh, driver behavior, more efficient vehicles, all that using less. <laughs> That's for all public bodies. And then there are quite an, uh, uh, well, a number of public bodies who use a large amount of energy for more specialized purposes. So local authorities use a lot of electricity for, pub for public lighting. <laughs> And it means, so in the context of using less, it means retrofitting our public lighting with LED technology and so forth. And there are significant initiatives underway in that regard. Water services, a lot of public sector electricity used for water services. Again, it means tackling that, using that more efficient equipment, right sizing of equipment, using it more efficiently and so forth. And then there are a small number of public bodies who use energy for very specialist purposes. And again, they will have to look at those those processes and see how can they use less. So that's the first principle in the, path, the pathway, using less. The second, of course, is to switch to renewables. And again, there are kind of three sub-pathways here that we need to be looking at. One is our heat, another is our transport, and the third is our electricity. In terms of heat, there are several well-established technologies that are available now, more or less. <laughs> heat pumps, bioenergy, especially solid biomass, and district heating, okay. On transport, again, well-established technologies that are there, biofuels, that's either blended into what we might call you know, standard specification, uh, petrol and diesel, high blend biofuel alternatives like uh, HVO, and of course, electric vehicles. Electricity, and it's an important one to take away, is because we are giving credit to all electricity users, for the benefit of Ireland decarbonizing its electricity grid, an individual public body can only sort of further reduce its electricity uh, greenhouse gas intensity through on-site generation. So we're talking about rooftop solar PV, you know, auto-generating wind turbines and things in effect inside the meter boundaries of our, of our organizations. All these technologies are available now. There are other technologies not shown here, there are others that will come down the track 
you know, hydrogen is one, <laughs> has the potential to play a significant role in heating and, and, and in transport. A couple of points though is, the first is there, there are no silver bullets here. Um, you know, there's no one size fits all solution. Um, most public bodies will need to look at a portfolio, uh, you know, adopt, take different elements um, of the pathways on, um, on renewables. Um, and the other thing is, you know, they all have barriers, they all have challenges associated with them. You know, retrofitting heat pumps in older buildings is a challenge, it requires typically, you know, significant fabric upgrades. <laughs> there are challenges with, with uh, bioenergy around, you know, um, some logistical concerns, <laughs> um, maintenance issues, uh, huge potential for district heating, but not yet, uh, you know, a lot of well-evolved networks to, 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 uh, to tie into. Uh, on transport, biofuels have a, you know, a limited p potential. Um, going beyond certain percentages in most vehicles, we'll, we'll, we'll hit a blend wall, we'll hit, we'll hit, we'll hit a, you know, a physical uh, barrier. The availability of feedstocks for uh, biofuels that we might be able to use on their own is limited. Uh, and there, you know, there could be supply chain issues. Electrification of, of vehicles has significant potential, but of course, more difficult for heavier vehicles and so forth. So these things are not, are not straightforward. And the question of green hydrogen, you know, it will come, but it's you know, unlikely to come at scale this decade. The third element though is, and this is an important one, is that we need to design our new facilities for zero or near zero emissions because it's an absolute target. Um, a lot of public bodies want to increase capacity. We need to build, we need new offices, we need to employ new people, we need new hospitals, we need new schools. <laughs> but if we're adding that capacity, even if it's the most efficient, energy efficient, carbon efficient facilities, every kilogram of CO2 is a kilogram in the wrong direction in the context of our target. So we need to bear that in mind and we need to, we need to design for, for, uh, for zero and near, or near zero. Um, the other point to make is, t two other points. One is that there are other technologies clearly there, there that aren't shown. And the second is that it's, this is all about a 2030 target and we're focused on this, you know, 51% reduction by 2030. But we have to keep an eye on 2050 and the, the long-term ambition. Uh, it may not be our job to deal with 2050, certainly the latter stages of it, but we've got to think about that now. And we, you know, we shouldn't, we can't be making decisions, particularly at the end of this decade, that only suit us to 2030 and then maybe the wrong decision for 2050. So we've got to consider technology lifespans um, and the rate of turnover of technology. You know, vehicles will turn over, you know, after a certain number of years. Heating systems though have longer lifespans. We're still going to change them a couple of times before 2050, but we need to think about that as, as we look at our pathways. Um, so I'll move on just to just to give a few examples of how a few real public bodies are identifying potential pathways for themselves. Um, and they're doing it using a, a gap to target tool, which is available to download from SEI's MNR system. And <coughs> um, it enables them to do very high level calculations for some of the technologies there that we talked about to decarbonize their organizations. And what I'm showing here is I'm a, a few charts for a few different public bodies. And I'll just explain what you're looking at first before I, I, I show you the numbers. This is a, a, a relatively small local authority. The bar on the left line, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The next bar from the left are its sa the savings it's made to date. So the third bar are its 2020 emissions. The next uh, white bar with the blue dotted line, that's the, where we, the, emissions, the, the emissions reductions we think it will get arising from uh, the decarbonization of Ireland's electricity system. So if it did nothing, we think we get down to this line going all the way across and we think therefore in this gray bar towards the right hand side, that's where we think it would get to if it did nothing from 2020. Its target is on the extreme right and then the orange bar is its gap to target. So it's 400,000, what are we looking at? Kilograms here for this, for this local authority here. Is its gap to target if it did nothing, okay? So what we can do here then is we can, the public body can model the impact at a very high level of some of these, these uh, technology options. And what this local authority done here is modeled is uh, I think about four or five retrofits across different buildings, four or five heat pumps, and then some solar PV, um, which is the green bar um, on the, uh, the, the rightmost green bar with some electric vehicles in the middle there. 
so we could see retrofits, heat pumps, uh, electric vehicles, and some uh, on-site PV. All together, that adds up to about uh, 250,000 kilograms, but it needed to bridge a gap of 400,000 kilograms, so we can see it's, it's about 150,000 still gap to target. Okay. So here, the public bodies identified a quite, a, you know, quite a significant amount of investment, but it's 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 uh, just a bit over halfway there, you know. And I am showing real examples of the gap to target here. Uh, I could show hypothetical ones where organisations have shown a beautiful pathway to 2030, but it's not that easy, you know. So um, this is, you know, we're 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 only at a certain stage in the journey. Looking at it, a, a, a third level institution about the same size as the the local authority. Um, Similar story here, four, you know, four or five retrofits, heat pumps, solar PV here, but this um, institution sees itself adding more capacity, adding more buildings to serve a growing population of, of students. And its default position was to design these very efficiently, but with gas-fired heating, and then obviously electricity as well. So we've got to add that in. And you can see that it's identified 185 what are we talking about? Thousands, kilograms of reductions, but then it's add, had to add back in 167,000 um, for these new facilities. So its gap is back up to 255,000. Okay, so it's a very powerful tool, incorporates uh, very simple high level calculations, but, but is a real reality check for organizations. You can see where, you know, just how far um, projects will bring them. And then a, another very different type of organization here, a much bigger one, um, you can see the scale on the, on, on, on the, on the left-hand side, we're now talking about tons, so it's about 25 times the emissions of the other two, um, transport-heavy organization. Looking at 400 retrofits, okay. Um, Bio-LPG here, electrification of a, a small proportion of its transport. A lot of its transport isn't 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 just you know isn't in the space that can be electrified easily. Um, some high blend biofuels for some of its heavier transport, and some solar PV and some a little bit of wind. A big project, 400 retrofits there. Okay, so a lot a lot of projects, but a big big gap to its target still. You add all this up, it's about 7,000 tons, and it's about 7,000 still to go. So. Um, I don't have any, I said, any really nice ones here that show a completely closed gap, but that's, that's the reality, you know. Um, I would encourage those of you who have access to this to, to download it and to use it. Um, this is how, you know, it's, it's an important tool for helping public bodies plan for their targets. But, it, uh, you know, it, the key thing is it's a reality check and it, 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 you, you get to see what the target um, means for your organisation. So, um, wrapping up, uh, three key takeaways for me today. The first is uh, really that first chart I put up and echoing Alan's chart from earlier. Our heat and transport emissions in the public sector have been flat for the last decade. You know, they vary a bit between public body to public body, but they've been flat and we've got to cut them in half. Simple as that. Um, Decarbonisation pathway, use less. Don't forget about the using less. Use renewable and also think hard, anything, any new capacity, any new facilities, you gotta design them for zero or near zero emissions. And finally, while we're acting, we need to act now for 2030, we need to keep an eye on 2050 as well. Okay, thanks very much. So we'll just pause there for about five or 10 minutes for some questions. If people have any questions, just if you stand up to the mic and ask them, just say your name and ask away. Uh, this session has been recorded, so people can watch it back later if need be. And obviously the slides will be made available. Apologies to those who are taking pictures in the first part of some of your slides there and then transitions onto further graphs. Um, you have a nice build up now to some of those graphs. Any, any questions? Yeah, do you, do you mind standing up to the microphone there? Just give us your name and ask your question. Uh, thank you very much. Andrew Smith, is this on? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, Andrew Smith, EPA Carbon Budget Fellow. Um, looking at it, it looks like it's going to be a lot easier to decarbonize transports than than buildings. Indeed, for almost all uh, public bodies, we could 
look at a 100% zero carbon target for transport by 2030. Maybe tricky for the fire service, but pretty much every other body. So I'm wondering, given this equal split emphasis on buildings and transport, is this really making it much harder for those buildings heavy organizations and making life much easier for the transport heavy organizations? And is, is there a way to balance that out perhaps? Um, good question. I suppose um, be interesting the perspective of uh, any transport heavy organizations who, who might be represented who feel who, who might feel there. I um I, I uh, you may have heard of the NHS net zero plan in yeah. the UK. Uh, I was the transport lead on that. So I'm, I'm yeah. speaking from a position well, of having written the net zero plan for a transport for uh, for the NHS. Yeah. Uh, certainly there are uh, it, it i suppose when you there are the short answer isn't there are currently no provisions within the, the arrangements to, to do that it's a short answer uh, and it's certainly the point that you know around the, the turnover of of the lifespan of vehicles versus heating systems and so forth there are there are elements of um uh transport consumption in the public sector though that will be difficult to to decarbonize um um bus fleet defense well the defense forces yeah yeah um, yeah so the, the heavy the heavy fleet yeah. the solutions for them are not particularly well available presently so and uh, local authorities would have a lot of vans and stuff but they'd also have a lot of uh, uh, truck beds and stuff and very specialized type equipment and there's no electric there at the moment and also there's probably, uh, as you in the audience, one of our transport advisors, there's no, um, there's still a little bit of uncertainty as to is electric the way to go for some of these heavier things or will there be more transport? Will there be hydrogen come along? Will there be other technologies? I know you're shaking your head, but this is the perception we're getting back from public bodies is, uh, um, especially with the larger bus fleets and train fleets and that all depends on electrification. Like they, they if it's not built within the plans, they're never going to achieve it. So. For some public bodies, it's going to be okay. And we also have the Clean Vehicle Directive kicking in in the next couple of years, which means any new uh, transport bought, even regardless if it's big, will have to be zero emissions. So that will naturally be caught up in the, in the replacement of vehicles. But for some, the, some the, their pathways are not very clear at the moment. Um, Irish Water have uh, did a review of their buildings of all their transport, even though they're a lot of electricity. They have two and a half thousand vehicles. And their their first exercise, rather than saying uh, let's replace all these with electric and look for electric replacements, is do we need them? So we have a big truck that drives around the place. Um, do we need that? Bring in pumps? Can we not just outsource it? Or do we you know? Do we need to have that? Can we not um, have a, a have a lower usage uh, alternative that's now electrifiable straight away? So they're looking at the energy service need, and they think they could cut their vehicles by a third or they could um, actually reduce the size of the vehicles they need. So that's kind of step one, because uh, the default is let's just replace with electric, uh, they use less. And then after that, it's where you can use renewables. I suppose, yeah, yeah just to, there, there are a number of public bodies would, would have large amounts of difficult to decarbonize transport, defense, uh, defense forces, uh, you know, rail, rail, obviously yeah. rail, uh, Long distance public transport and so forth. Any thanks for that? Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, Douglas Gordon, Quest Utility Services. I special. I'm a specialist in field effect technology, which means magnetic technology or types of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we can save on transport ten to twelve percent. I have that happening in Ireland, and uh, more efficiency, more torque in the vehicle, but. Seeing presentations, not just this one, the ones earlier, um, this, when it comes to gas or oil power boilers, um, there's no, there's, it's talk about switching to other methods, but there's a 10 to 20% saving in that sector. My previous research showed that SEAI has no category for this technology. This technology, won the uh, Nobel Science Prize in 1910 for the methodology. And uh, the, it's been around a long time. 
Yeah, can but I, I see. Maybe just ask the question. Yeah, but the question is, it's it's not in the category, therefore it's not being promoted. And I see these graphs, these horizontal graphs, mm -hmm. but this is where you can uh, make the downturn. Absolutely. Um, so uh, where, where do we go with that is the question. Good question. Um, you're, so I assume you mean the triple E list or the, the accelerated capital allowance list of equipment. Is that, that when you say recognized list? Because that would be the only recognized list we have of, yeah. So that is currently being reviewed and they will be looking at expanding it and revitalizing it and putting the new systems for it. So uh, that's gonna take, probably happen over the next year or two. So keep an eye out for that. And that's would list best performing equipment and equipment that can save energy. Um, some suppliers have reached out to us and say, listen, I have a system that can save 10, I can save 30% of this controller at that, it's proven. Um, I still think there's gonna be a role for that because some puppy bodies, when they look at their pathway, they will default to, I just got to renewable everything um, or reduce it. But there's probably still within their portfolio to 2030, they're going to have to still keep fossil fuels and they're going to have to look at a, a blended portfolio of let's reduce the amount of kilowatt hours of fossil fuel we use. We get 30% here, which means we don't need as much renewable over here. Um, the default for a lot of puppy bodies we're seeing is we got we to gotta take the fossil fuels out. But there's still a role for those technologies. Um, but there's probably a growing acceptance. There will be hybrid sort of arrangements. So fossil fuel or renewable would be the main heating system, and then it could be topped up through fossil fuel or something like that. So um, how people are going to deal with this practically and their routes to doing this, they're still uh, at, at site level, they're still up for grabs. Uh, at the moment, most puppy bodies, and you'll hear now from two examples, are really just at the trying to plan it, you know, I pay to see of 3,000 buildings. What's the overall approach for them before we get down to the site level? Uh, so, and the equipment, keep an eye out for the Triple E to get listed on that. Uh, there hasn't been any investment on that really over the next, next last couple of years. So that's all going to be revitalized. You might be looking at new categories. That's a reason to look at that. And generally, I think it's going to put a big push on the marketplace to uh, look for guaranteed savings. So you already have Article 7 out there that's looking at actual savings. This is gonna put an even bigger push on, on actual savings. So show me, the, show me the kilowatt hours saving reductions because that's all that's gonna matter is the absolute reductions. Yeah. We're gonna take, do I have time for one more question? Yeah. yeah. Just on, sorry, Cal McCoy, Dublin City Council, the fleet management. So just on the, going back to the first point, design for net zero, um, with regard to HGVs and heavier vehicles, does that just mean across the board focus on electricity as far as is possible? Or is design for net zero, you know, if you were to take in HVO and, and biofuel to the place like that, is that just more or less a waste of time at this stage? Because, you know, you're not, you're not going towards net, net zero in that way. Um, I suppose the context of design for net zero is primarily in the focus of sort of adding new uh, building capacity um, in terms of, you know, uh, if you're adding new buildings and the heating systems. But of course, um, it applies to, to uh, the, uh, the principle that if you're adding new fleet capacity, then, it, you know, that's their extra kilograms of emissions that are in the wrong direction for you. There are various different options. Um, the reality is you're not going to have a, you, you, the fleet you invest in now is not going to be rolling in 2050 though, I suppose is, is yeah. the issue. So there's kind of a more scope on transport for a pathway, you know, a genuine pathway kind of transition yeah. to different technologies yeah, over no, time. I'm just thinking about design for net zero, like designing the, like a complex at Dublin City Council will, they have a new north in, inner city operations depot opening up. And if we were to design that, for net zero, that would be electrifying of main infrastructure for an entirely electric fleet. And, you know, just using the electric fleet as much as possible or as much yeah. as the market will allow us. I, I think and, you're, uh -huh. uh, I was gonna kind of repeat what I said about Irish water. Your first kind of thing is, do we need to be doing the service? So do you need that amount of vehicles on the road that use less concept um, before you even get into buying or, designing something that's going to use less is uh, just start using it. So we're, we're sending a, we we're just talking with one of the councils the other day and they were saying, you know, we're just gonna have to stop doing stuff. So uh, 
councillors want us to go out and check this stuff and drive around the place um we can't do that anymore we're putting up public lights randomly for for people that want them in particular areas we're going to have to get stronger in that and maybe refuse the money in, unless there's specific grounds so it's really going to put a pressure on why are we doing this and do we really need to do it is this our core out of value you're, you can't just be randomly using kilowatt hours and then if you need a vehicle to do that service then you gotta buy one or the point Liam is making is design it so it uses the least amount of energy first of all and then it uses renewable energy that's that kind of concept you're going to yeah just specifically about the two technologies you mentioned i suppose more broadly ireland has a, and you know a, a net zero target for 2050 including electricity so if we electrify things uh and you know as public bodies we're, we're kind of you know we, if we make the decision to electrify where that's where that's feasible, then it's, you know, to an extent, it's other parts of, you know, it's the grid's problem to, to, del to deliver the, to ultimately get to zero. Um, and on respect to HVO, which you mentioned, you know, sustainable biofuels, including, you know, sustainable HVO would also carry a, a carry a, a, a emission factor of zero as well, you know, but there are, you know, there's, there's only so much HVO out there. Um, but you've hit on the nub of the, 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 the core of it. Um, you're going to have to look at, do we need these services? Look ahead to all your different depots and stuff. Do we need to, do we need this in the first place? And then what are our pathways for what we have left? Do we wait till 2027 and wait till we think a new technology comes in and replace everything and set up our depots and everything for a completely new way of operating or do we do it differently? So there is some fundamental it's, it's really going to put pressure on planning and uh, long term planning. And uh, like when we started talking about this target, firstly, to some public bodies are going, well, hold on, I, I want to build 17 new buildings. And I have a new organization going to be created and it's going to double the amount of my energy usage. You know, I need a special dispensation. And it's a new narrative people need to get around. Um, we can't be doing these things and using carbon. We can't just we need to accept we can't use carbon, especially. And if you, if you, the other targets I was talking about that are coming down from the EU, the 1.7 and the 3%, it's also going to set targets on the amount of kilowatt hours we can use, which is really going to be a game changer. That's going to be really tough. Thanks. We might move on now. I know there's probably other questions, but we can take as many at the end. Um, I'm going to introduce Erla Kyle. Um, who works on the Pathfinder program at SEI, who's going to talk about all the capital supports that are happening. Thanks, Alan. So uh, my name is Orla Coyle. I'm program manager for the uh, project support unit within SEI. So I work uh, alongside Alan and we're involved in trying to work with the public sector to deliver some of these programs and to deliver some of the, the, the savings. So uh, I'm not really going to touch on this slide because uh, Alan and Liam have covered it, but there is that 51% target in terms of um, the CO2 emission reduction. But I will just touch on there's some changes to the to the uh, Energy Performance of Buildings Directive and the EED Directive, and I've focused this more on the retrofit side because under the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, we have coming down the track is a uh, new building will be. Uh, zero emission buildings and as Liam already mentioned we need to start looking at zero emission buildings already before the, it comes into the building regulations but those zero emission buildings um, are also going to be what is deep renovation and that's what is going to be our target for all of our buildings by 2050. So again rather than just meeting this 2030 target of a uh, 51% uh, reduction in our direct emissions and a 50% reduction in our emissions we have to be conscious that that zero emission target is going to be there for 2050 under the uh, EU directives. Uh, it's also worth noting that there's going to be minimum energy performance uh, standards for all of our buildings. So as we go forward, you'll have a minimum energy standard for each of your buildings, whether it be domestic, non-domestic or public. And that's, that's what's currently outlined in the directive. Now that directive is under discussion at the moment. So it, it hasn't been finalized, but it has been discussed at EU level. Uh, so there may be changes to it, but it's to have that in context uh, when we talk about the, the work that we're trying to do. So with the project support unit, what we try to do is we work in partnership with a lot of the public sector bodies. And we work with them in terms of trying to identify, well, what buildings need to be upgraded and how do you upgrade them? 
we give them technical support, uh, whether through financing design teams or, or actually working with them ourselves and bring them through the process to see, well, what are the steps that need to be carried out to achieve those uh, 2030 targets? We also give them capital support. So as Alan said, there's, there's in the order of 33 million available this year that we're working with them to, to spend that money to retrofit these buildings. We also support energy performance contracting as part of the program and assist in terms of uh, putting contracts in, in place. And the idea is that the, we take the learnings from those projects and we actually feed that back out to uh, everybody in the public sector and in the commercial sector about what is the right approach. So the idea is that that, that will fit, feed in then into developing the supply chain and developing the capabilities and developing guidance documents so that it can be rolled out at that national scale and we can try to achieve the targets. So that's the role of what we what we do. Uh, the, Pathfinder program, which is what Alan asked me to, to mention or talk most about, is uh, has been in place since 2017. So originally it was in place with the Department of Education where we supported them in the retrofit of schools uh, and uh, the OPW through the central government. And then the HSC came on board in 2018 and the higher, edu came, uh, higher education came on board in 2020. And we're currently working with the local authorities and we had initial discussions with the Defence Forces last year about trying to bring them into the process as well. And these are the, the, the high energy users within the public sector. So the idea is that we're working with these to try reduce some of their energy consumption. And there's different approaches for different sectors. We have, say for example, with the, the schools projects, we're heavily involved, we're, we're sitting on uh, the, the kind of steering group or sitting on the um, technical reviews of the designs. With the HSC, we supported uh, the formation of an energy bureau so that they had an energy bureau going out, looking at the energy consumption in each of their uh, buildings. And as I said, there's different approaches for different, um, different sectors and we'll talk a bit more about it. How the Pathfinder works is that it's, as I said, it's a partnership. It's, it's not a grant scheme. What we'd want to do is we want to work with the public sector partners and bring them through the process. So uh, we, it's formed by developing a position paper. So we decide, well, what is it that we're trying to achieve? What are the outcomes that we want from this process? And that forms a, an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding. And the idea is that SEI come in with the support in terms of the capital support and, and financial support. But we also come in with the technical support in terms of assisting them so that they can understand the, the impact of the various different decisions that they make and also around the governance side that we oversee it to make sure that the money has been spent in the right direction. From the uh, public sector body's point of view, we try to bring in their leadership. So their uh, director of services from the local authorities or uh, you know, the, the, um, the leadership team so that we are getting at the top level are, are making these decisions that feed into the MOU. We also, uh, they also form the kind of the strategic approach for their, they're obviously familiar with their own sectors and, and the, the requirements for their own sectors. So they feed into the strategic approach as to how this is all going to be achieved. And we share the funding. So it's 50, 50% funding between us and the public body. And the idea then is that we're developing these kind of scalable models, developing those best practice approaches and developing the kind of structures that then it can be rolled out at that national scale. So when we started it in 2017, uh, we, we started basically around capacity development and it started off as a shallow retrofit, it was single measures. So we may have gone into the OPW offices and changed the lighting or it, it started off that process. But you can see as the targets have changed and as the ambition has changed, so is the program. So since 2021, it's more focused on, or the priority is around that deep retrofit and renewable heat. And the idea is that we're trying to bring these, decarbonize these buildings and um, doing them at, uh, you know, doing major works on them. Uh, in 2022, we've had uh, an increase in funding. We've, we started off, when I joined the program in 2020, uh, my colleague, Fergus Sharkey, who uh, is, Head of the business side now uh, was originally started off the program but when i joined it in 2020 the budget was around 9 million it's now up at we're we're hoping in the order of about 33 million this year or 28 to 33 million depending on what projects get across the line but that's the scale of it and the idea is that it, it'll possibly scale up again next year and for the next number of years so that we can uh, 
continue the momentum. As I said, this, the, the finance goes towards technical support, whether it's the appointment of design teams, whether it's the formation of these energy bureaus to assist the public bodies, or whether then it's the capital support where we're actually giving money towards actually doing the projects in terms of retrofitting the buildings. Now you can do still do shallow measures as long as it's on that pathway to, to zero emissions. So we don't support um, fossil fuels, obviously, and we don't support anything that will lock you into fossil fuels. Just for your information, we just launched uh, our website last year, or we updated the website last year. Uh, so we now have the details of the Pathfinder program, uh, the various different partners that are in it, and we are starting to kind of publish kind of detailed uh, technical case studies so that people can actually see the, the work that has gone on in the various different buildings uh, and get more information about it. What we'll also be doing is publishing guidance documents. We're currently working on a, on a guidance document, say, with the Department of Education on how to retrofit schools. So those kind of guidance documents will also be going up on, on the website. So do keep an eye on it. Just to give you a, a flavor of some of the work that we're doing, and I won't go into this too much because uh, John is coming up in terms of talking about the HSC, but when we first formed with the HSC in 2018, we formed that Energy Bureau. And last year, uh, th those th they initially started on those kind of shallower measures. And then last year, they identified these kind of 10 buildings. And again, I won't talk about it too much because I'll ruin John's presentation. But these were the kind of archetypes of buildings that they wanted to uh, investigate as to how to retrofit. So what we're doing with those buildings is we've appointed design teams to understand how would they retrofit those uh, 10 buildings to actually bring them to it in our targets for 2030. Uh, another example is with the Higher Education Authority. What we did was we commissioned a study back in 2020 looking at, well, how do you decarbonize your buildings? and what is the pathway to decarbonize them and, and achieve those 2030 targets. So that study came up with six pathways. And then last year we ran a competition for all the higher education institutes and asked them to, to submit projects where they were going to achieve one of these uh, pathways or where they could look at one of these pathways. So that competition was ran. And we currently have eight buildings uh, that have just recently gone through, uh, gone to stage 2A design, where they've gone through each of the pathways and we're hopefully, we'll hopefully be appointing uh, or giving approval to proceed to uh, site this summer for uh, most of them uh, or some of those projects. Um, so, and they should be going to uh, site this summer. So again, that's work that we're doing with the, with the HEA and the Department of Further Education. And then another example is these are projects that were done last year for um, the schools where, that wasn't me, <laughs> uh, the, for the schools where we have uh, nine schools uh, that are all being, have, are having deep retrofit carried out. And there's also uh, renewable heat going into them. There's a, two of them that are going to have biomass and seven of them that are going to have uh, heat pumps. And the renewable is actually going to meet 90% of the uh, space, heat, space heating demand. So they, do, they are topped up with uh, boilers if necessary. But, and again, there's different approaches. Some of them are decant schools that the, a school has recently moved out. So we now have the opportunity to work on it throughout the year whereas others are work that's going to be carried out in the summer and we've had to phase it over a couple of summers. Uh, this year we have another six projects that uh, have just been uh, completed the concept design and are going to site again and it uh, looks like five of those will be heat pump and one of them will be biomass. Um, so it's a continuous process and it's a continuous update and, th and that's how we go through the process with them uh, in terms of bringing them through it. So with that I'm going to pass over to, is it John on next? No, thanks. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I can see I'm larger than life on the screen. Um, so it's, it's not all bad. So I'll share my presentation. Is that OK? Perfect. Yeah. Oh, excellent. So um, good afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Walsh. Um, I'm a senior m and &E engineer at the Department of Education. Um, so I just want to let you know that um, uh, I'm stepping in for John Dolan, who was um, uh, planning to uh, present um, for the department. Uh, he just can't make it this week. But um, I'm, I'm keen to um, just talk you through what 
journey we've uh, we've come on on delivering climate action um, in schools and uh, and how we're going to move forward. So um, to start, um, this is what I'm going to go through in the presentation. First of all, we're going to go on energy profiling on um, basically finding a baseline on where we are at present. Then going to touch on capital program delivery. Look at the uh, priorities and strategy over the national development plan period. Um, look forward into the next generation of capital delivery program. And of course, um, talk about how we're going to deliver the climate action agenda and expand upon uh, what Orla mentioned earlier about the um, energy retro retrofit uh, pathfinder um, for uh, Department of Education. So just a little bit of background on um, our um, energy policy and research program. So we started quite a long time ago, back in 1997, um, and, and so this, we've moved forward from then quite substantially. Um, but uh, you, I suppose the main thing that I'd like to get across is the school needs are quite different to uh, the general domestic and commercial market needs. Uh, the operational profiles can be quite different. Um, one of which is the hours of operation. Um, whereas say for example, in the um, HSC in hospital environment, you've got a 365 day a year operation. In schools, the operational hours can be only 12% of the whole year. So um, quite a limited time frame. Um, with all due respect, the um, technical um, ability say for example on caretakers on site is variable and can be limited at times. So that needs to be bared in mind. Um, and energy is not a core function, it, it's, it's teaching. Um, so with that, um, particularly for M&E, solutions required must be simple, robust, reliable and responsible or sorry, responsive um, to needs. It's also very important to optimize capital running costs and maintenance. On the um, graphic on the right hand side, you'll see the energy usage in uh, primary schools over the, the last, uh, say, uh, 40 years or so. Uh, you can see there's a there's a massive reduction, but uh, as discussed earlier in the this afternoon, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and on that, our, our schools have been A3 rated since 2006. Um, th there was some discussion about the uh, monitoring and reporting. Um, system from the SEAI, um, and i just like to talk about the Department of Education's um, a role in that. Um, so we have approximately 4,000 schools, so a very large portfolio, and of those, um, just under 3,000 um, reported. So that's about a 76% 76, compl 76 compliance rate. Um, the energy spend about 34 million for those uh, 2,800 schools. Um, if you include for the quarter that haven't um, reported, you're probably looking at uh, between 50 and 55 million, I would guess, of the total public um, of the energy expenditure. Um, so that uh, makes up roughly 6% of the public sector expenditure for energy, um, which seems quite low for that number of buildings. Um, but you must bear in mind the operating hours are substantially lower than many public buildings, um, especially hospitals and offices. And that also has a side effect. Um, so if you think about any upgrades we do, especially to fabric upgrades, which can be capital intensive, uh, the payback period can be very long. So that needs to be bared in mind. Um, and just a quick one there on schools and ETBs represent a 10% energy improvement uh, towards the overall public sector target. So there's some good work uh, that's been done. Um, on the capital program delivery, uh, the uh, Department of Education is responsible for one of the largest public uh, capital programs. Uh, we do have a strong track record of delivery and innovation. And to give you a feel for the scale um, in between 2018 and 2021, 
about 700 school building projects were completed. Um, so that delivered in excess of uh, 60,000 school places. So um, it's heartening to see that. Um, it's a good lot of work. Um, just to, to bring us back to the uh, department's goal, um, we, um, it is to uh, build a modern and sustainable school infrastructure that provides a place in a safe and inspiring learning physical environment for all students now and in the future. So with that in mind, um, we have in at present um, over 1200 school building projects within, um, within the various stages of planning, design, tender and construction. So um, I suppose that's what was mentioned earlier in the presentation about building new um, infrastructure or requirements with carbon which have a carbon consequence. There are certain things that you just have to do. And if a school place is required, um, it's required. Um, but we do try obviously to minimize that if we can. Um, so in, in time frames, most of those are expected to be under construction or completed in the next few years. And uh, with regard to capital expenditure funding, uh, 4.4 billion. So quite a quite a large sum. Um, this is a, a GIS um, map, so a graphic um, information system. I just like to put this in really as a, to give as a nod to colleagues in who developed this over the last couple of years. But this is very useful for us in um, laying out where our um, projects are. It, it lays out all the schools in the country the size of the schools, the number of pupils, the area of the schools. Um, also, it can be very useful for us in, in planning for the future. So we can input demographical changes or foreseeable demographic changes. Um, so where there will be a, uh, an increase in say, um, uh, primary child uh, population, say in 20 years time, we can plan for uh, further school places there. So each of those dots then is, is one of our larger projects. Um, uh, I suppose a little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, I'd just like to get in a bit of our advertising if, if I can. Um, in the coming weeks, uh, the uh, department will be publishing a new call for a uh, consultant's frameworks across all disciplines. Um, and these are ranging in size and uh, complexity with a value between three and 25 million plus. Uh, so that might be something you could consider and bring back to your directors or um, organization. Cheers. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, on um, priorities and strategy for the NDP period um, we're currently in, the first priority for us really is uh, capacity. Um, and uh, foremost is that any child that needs a school place gets a school place in, in the current year. Um, also very important, of course, is the climate change agenda. And also we're working on implementation of a school estate uh, maintenance program. So that will optimize the buildings for the future. Um, in no particular order, here are some of the elements that we're looking to uh, improve upon and, and further develop for the future projects. So uh, program management, uh, due to that large number of projects, it's, uh, we need to optimize that. Um, further, further develop the GIS system, uh, continue updating our uh, design team procedures um, and the technical guidance, um, continue developing or delivering projects to BIM level seven, which will help us um, in facilities management in the future. Um, continue and further uh, emphasis on quality um, for throughout the whole project cycle. Digital information management systems to support our collaboration. And of course, the climate change agenda. So on that, um, as we've gone through, uh, we're looking at a 51% reduction in uh, greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas um, emissions from the public sector by 2030 and of course, zero carbon by 2050. Um, a, key, a key deliverable 
um, by the end, required by the end of this year, comes from the Annex of Actions out of the Climate Action Plan. And, and three main parts of that are uh, a school-specific climate action mandate that will set out how our sector will meet uh, decarbonization targets. Um, also, a climate action roadmap, setting out how um, energy efficiency um, and uh, greenhouse gas emission targets will be delivered all the way out to 2050. And then also on the um, how we will work towards the energy efficiency targets uh, um, to um, in the next few years as well. Okay, so um, here are some items that we're working on um, in delivering the climate action agenda. Um, so a major part is the energy profile of our buildings. So we need to find out what we're dealing with. Um, and we are carrying out several hundred um, energy assessments essentially this year um, on uh, our schools. Um, so we hope to complete that by the end of the year, uh, which will inform us going forward. Um, continue our research and demonstration program. The um, guidance documents, um, uh, one of which is the energy retrofit that we're working with in collaboration with the SEAI. Um, commencing the move from high carbon, so say oil boilers, um, uh, to, um, to decarbonize those on, on a sustainable glide, glide path. Implementing a climate action summer works program and rollout, importantly, of a national deep energy retrofit program. So on the Pathfinder, um, so Orla has gone through this. Um, so we've worked quite uh, uh, in depth with SEAI on this. And on the right, you see some of the schools that we've uh, worked with um, since 2017. Um, that's the scale of the, of the Pathfinder. These are the um, project brief, or what are the requirements for uh, the Pathfinder? So it's a BER, B rating. And we are looking at a renewable heating system meeting a minimum of 90% of the annual space heating demand. So <clears throat> that would be where there is exceptionally cold weather or colder weather we would have a fossil fuel system to, to carry that unusually cold weather. Um, so there are two main areas that we've been looking at, in, or solutions rather. One is heat pumps and the other are biomass. For heat pumps, which I think most of you are aware, um, due to their lower operating temperature, fabric upgrades are critical. So we're looking to get the heat loss of the building down to less than 55 watts per meter squared. Um, we're also looking at biomass with the ESCO model, which is the energy supplier company model. And uh, crucially, a 50% carbon savings reduction uh, to the school. Um, we're also involving an EED expert um, to uh, design and po post-occupancy performance. Okay, so out of that came, I suppose, four main challenges. Um, in particular for heat pumps, electrical infra infrastructure is key due to the extra load. Um, and also with heat pumps is the fabric improvement. Um, heat recovery ventilation will have a part to play to reduce um, heat load. And the heating system must be compatible with, for example, if it's heat pumps or biomass. Um, on the fabric um, work we, we were carrying out, um, here are some typical um, works used for the scheme. And below are the um, uh, U-values, which, which tend to be typical. And, and they'll be selected on a cost optimum um, solution. Um, on the m and &E technologies, um, as I mentioned, heat pumps, of course. Uh, heat recovery ventilation has a part to pay. Um, controls are key, especially with this more complex equipment. Lighting has kind of large savings. Simple things like time clocks and hot water. PV. 
And this uh, slide show here shows uh, typical outcomes of the Pathfinder. So energy savings in the region of 45%, um, CO2 emissions, reduction of 58% we're seeing, and as I said, 90% of space heating uh, generated by renewable heating. And then just finally, um, here is a, um, a picture of before and after in a school in Monaghan that was delivered last year. And um, you know, apart from the energy savings, uh, you can see, I think, plainly the, the further benefits in, ter in terms of aesthetics. So you, you would think, which school would you prefer your child to go to? Um, and also you can see the couple of quotes, um, which shows the um, greater comfort that can be garnered from uh, the works carried out. So um, thanks for your attention. Um, and I'll, I'll pass it over to the chair. So the first thing, just the HSE and, and what we do, so there's three main or six main streams to the, uh, the HSE and, uh, and the Estates Department and we're responsible for the delivery of the capital, uh, capital projects and this amounts to around about a billion a year. Uh, we also manage property management, uh, the fire safety for our organisations as well, uh, health and safety and infrastructural risk and maintenance and then lastly energy and sustainability. And the Energy and Sustainability Office is headed up by Peter Smith, who's the Assistant National Director, and he's supported by the two estate managers, uh, Kevin Sheridan and myself. And uh, our primary duties are to support Peter in the decarbonisation strategy for the HSE. So just, I know, I know Liam uh, 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 presented these kind of graphs kind of a little bit earlier for, um, uh, uh, for public bodies and what the targets are going to be. This is a what the targets for the HSE are going to be and it was Liam that actually took a lot of our figures and actually plugged them in and you can see just the breakdown in our uh, in our fuel in our fuel usage so our baseline usage is 230 kilotons for our baseline years uh, you can see the split there for electricity and uh, thermal energy with transport actually making up a very small part of that as well uh, mainly around kind of the ambulance service and things like that but it's a very small piece of the pie um, ultimately, where we need to get to is the um, is the 2030 target. That's the kind of magic number that the HSC has to get to. So we need to get from 230 kilotons down to 99 kilotons, and there'll be a little bit associated with the decarbonisation of the electricity grid. So what it means is that the HSEs or the, the uh, carbon savings that the HSC has to generate by its own actions is around about 65 kilotons. That's where we need to get to. And as Lee mentioned earlier, it's the, this is the electricity part. It just kind of follows down along on that glide path. And uh, we're making the majority of our savings there the on the thermal side, so reducing that by 51%. These are very much just the indicative figures kind of at the moment, but that's the targets that, that we're actually working to, and that's how we're developing our programs. Uh, how does that look kind of in real terms, and what does our glide path look like? And again, this is, this is the graph that kind of Liam was showing kind of up earlier. Uh, we've got, sorry, we've got our baseline here of 230, uh, 64 is going to come out of the decarbonisation of the grid and then all of the different work streams that we, we're looking to kind of make the changes so we can get down to our target of uh, our 2030 target and then our 2050 target. So this is the behavioural change element, so from uh, uh, projects that we've undertaken since 2018, we've been able to kind of get a certain percentage of savings associated with just behavioural change, no cost or low cost kind of items, uh, and that's represented there. So we just extrapolate it out for our entire building stock, equally then the shallow retrofit uh, projects, and uh, EV as well is kind of in there as well. And uh, 
to actually track performance, what the HSE are looking to do. We're, going to, we're developing a, a decarbonisation tool or an energy performance and carbon performance tool, and we've partnered up with IBM to develop that. And what we're looking to do is really track our performance in real time. So the first thing that we're doing there is, and we've got a parallel work stream in place, is we're putting energy meters in, in all of our facilities. We're firstly targeting our top, top energy users, our significant energy users. So there's 150 of them within the HSE. So we'll be able to track our performance in real time. And then secondly to that is that as we're progressing with a lot of our, our retrofit and our sustainability kind of projects, uh, we'll be able to pump the figures kind of into that or input the figures into this, the, into this tool, uh, this, this online kind of tool, and, um, and, and it'll show the benefit that it would actually have of, of the different uh, sustainability kind of procedure that we're going to put in place or, or opportunity. So th the example would be maybe, you know, kind of solar panels. If we want to put solar panels into all of our community nursing units in the uh, nationwide, um, what impact is that going to have on diverted electricity and how will that impact on our glide path? So that's the kind of thinking of what we're trying to do with the decarbonisation tool. And then the last piece is really it's to, uh, the decarbonisation tool is to, to, to project the carbon emissions for our new developments uh, in part in the, as we deliver our capital plan. So at the moment, um, our, the, we, we've updated the capital approvals process to include as one of the, the metrics to, to evaluate projects the amount of carbon emissions that this particular facility is going to have. So in, if anybody's familiar with Q-Cost of how it works, it'll be very similar to a Q-Cost kind of base system. So you're looking to develop a 100-bed CNU unit, you put in kind of all of your metrics uh, in Q-Cost and that gives you out what the budget cost for that particular facility should be. We're looking to develop a similar tool that's going to give us that figure for, a, uh, for new capital plan developments and then we'll be able to stick that into our uh, decarbonisation tool here as well. So we'll be able to track our performance then as the years go by and those, de de those developments come on stream. Uh, now, on top of that as well, we, we have developed a decarbonisation strategy and action plan and uh, that's, it's, it's almost completed in draft format and we hope to actually be publishing that later in the year, so Q2 2022. And that's really going to set out main three pillars of how we're going to achieve or how we hope to achieve compliance with the climate action plan and the HSE's targets that we have in place. So the first thing we have to do and Lee sorry and, and Lee mentioned it earlier is our capital plan. We're 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 a um, we're not a static organization. Uh, we have to uh, deliver healthcare kind of facilities in line with best practice um, um, health um, health obligations and, and health the health needs. And how do we do that? Considering the uh, the climate action plan targets are are absolute and uh, they're, they're based on a baseline of 2016 to 2018 consumption figures. So again, what we have to do is we have to ensure that all of our new facilities are net carbon zero or net carbon zero ready. Um, I think that the phrase you used, a kilogram kind of, you know, in our new facilities is a kilogram in the wrong direction. And, and that's the approach that we're kind of taking to it as well. Uh, the next thing then is our existing building stock and how do we crack that nut? Because we do have around about 4,500 4, facilities. Uh, so the intention would be that we have to actually undertake a deep retrofit program, but what that's going to look like. So what we or what is it going to look like and what are the solutions going to be? Um, and, and where do we target it? So what we're doing is we're going to, we're, we're implementing a pilot project as, as uh, Oral had mentioned earlier. So there's 10 sites that we've actually selected where we're going to actually carry out an analysis. And then lastly then, it's the Energy Bureau. And the Energy Bureau is supported by SEI through that memorandum of understanding, uh, through the engagement then, or the, the, uh, we, we brought energy officers kind of on stream. And their main kind of body of work is, it's this behavioral change, setting up green teams on our, on our large sites and carrying out the shallow retrofit kind of works that we actually do on our facilities. So to go into, the, into each of the streams in a little bit more detail, it's the 10 pilot sites that we're doing. Um, and uh, we're, we're, what, we, what we intend to do is we, we tend to uh, take it up to a stage one feasibility study. What's actually required to bring those these 10 pilot sites up to a B rating, a 51% reduction in carbon emissions and a 50% improvement in energy efficiency. That's what the target is. Now we went through a fairly extensive process in selecting those sites 
and uh, the breakdown of the sites is there's, there's four acute facilities, one acute facility located in each region, so in the, the Dublin Northeast area, one in the Dublin Mid Leinster area, one in the west and one in the south, and then the other six facilities then are, uh, are community type facilities, so primary care centres, community nursing units, those, type of th those types of facilities. The reason why we were splitting it out across the four regions as well, we just want to make sure that all the four regions of the HSC are all learning together at the same rate. So it's spread across the country and this is going to be a national approach. Uh, one of the other kind of considerations in picking the sites was that we weren't, we didn't pick our best performing sites or our worst performing sites. We picked sites that were indicative of uh, the type of building stock within that region. So we could get our best bang from a book, learn the most. So, we, so anything that we come up with out of this feasibility study is uh, scalable. That's the, the kind of objective. And maybe to give you a quick example is Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital in Drada is one of those sites that we picked. And uh, the, main, the main block of, of, of that hospital was, was built in the 1950s. There was a major extension done in the 1970s. There was a new uh, wing actually then added on in, in the early 2000s. And then there's been two new recent developments, one completed in 2014 and the other completed in 2018 as well. So you can see there's a great cross section of different building types, but different building construction types and different services that go into it again. So there's a huge amount to learn just from that one site. And that's the, that's the, the approach that we took for, for all of the sites that, that we selected uh, across the region. Uh, at this stage, there's funding approved to take it to stage one. That's through SEI's MOU with the HSE. And uh, what we've done is we've just completed the tender, the, the procurement process to appoint four design teams, one for each of the regions, a technical advisor team that's going to be have an overarching kind of review, and uh, they're going to manage the four design teams, but also collate all of the information coming back from the four from the four design teams to ensure that good solutions that are identified in one region get brought over into the other region as well. So there's good cross-pollination kind of, of ideas as well. And then we're also in the process of looking at engaging energy uh, EPC um, uh, specialist advisors as well. The output that we hope to get, we hope to find out what are the technical solutions and the challenges to those technical solutions. Uh, Again, infection control is one of our big kind of challenges that we face in, in healthcare facilities as well. That comes down to things like Legionella control. How do we manage the Legionella control? We're trying to go down to carbon zero or trying to remove fossil fuels. Um, heat pumps by their nature are, um, are, 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 low, are low grade heat. So again, how do we boost our temperature up to 60 degrees Celsius to, uh, to meet our Legionella control uh, requirements again? So that's one of the major challenges. That's what we actually want to find out as part of this, this, this pilot Pathfinder program. And then all the other technical solutions that actually go with it as well. Uh, building fabric upgrades, you know, kind of this, this kind of stuff as well, other kind of PV, how can that be utilised kind of on site? So these are the types of things we're looking for. And then one of the most important things that we want to kind of get out of this as well is what financial mechanisms are we going to use to deliver this? Uh, and how much is it actually going to cost uh, for the 10 sites? Now, we actually think that there's, there's a climate action fund in, in place already. We'd, we'd hope to be able to kind of tap into that. Equally, we're going to be providing some of the funding to this ourselves through the HSE's capital plan. And uh, what we want to do is we want to identify what role EPC contracting can actually play in this. And that's private finance again, because the numbers that we're actually talking about to deliver uh, compliance with the Climate Action Plan are very large numbers. So again, we won't be able to deliver it just by ourselves uh, as the HSE, as a, as a public body. We will need private finance as well to actually help and come to the table as well. So what do we hope to get kind of out of the pilot study? I kind of mentioned a few of the things that we want to get out on the design side for each of the different facilities and then pull that all together. But equally, it is a pilot study. And what we want to do is we want to get the learnings out of the pilot study and how can we extrapolate that learning at an organizational level? Because this, this pilot project is not about 10 sites. It's about the HSE at an organizational level. And how do we look at that? And there's a number of ways that we can actually look at it. One is our significant energy users. We've got about 4,500 facilities, but our significant energy users are 150. They account for 80% of the HSE's energy demand. So again, it's a big, big number. So what do we do? Do we target the significant energy users as the ones that we're going to go after to try and uh, get, you know, kind of like the organizational compliance level? 
um, that seems like the most appropriate way to go with it. But equally, we have a parallel work stream going on by, by a, a another assistant national director in the HSC, and what we're doing is we're looking at an acidity and property strategy as well. So out of all of the facilities that we have, what facilities have a long-term usage, a strategic importance to the, to, the, uh, to, the, to, to the service, to the clinical service, for the deliver of clinical service at a regional level, and then out of those facilities, what, what buildings in there um, can actually be upgraded and, and is it practical to upgrade them or should we be looking at kind of building some new facilities as well. So really the solution that we could be coming to is a combination of upgrading a lot of our existing building stock but also supplementing that with, uh, with new buildings, uh, new more efficient buildings and then disposing of buildings that actually don't, that, that are going to be too complicated or too costly uh, and it doesn't make sense to kind of de uh, to develop. Uh, as part of this as well, we will be looking at the phasing out of fossil fuels uh, for our entire building stock and, and how will that actually be managed as well over a short term or a long term period. We, there will be cases where fossil fuels will, will still be used and we will still be uh, installing more fossil fuel type systems in, in the future, but they will only be for emergency kind of situations. If a boiler went down and there was a strategic importance to actually get a new boiler kind of put in place to keep the service operational. But apart from that, we are be phasing out fossil fuels kind of over the next number of years. Uh, the figure that we're looking at here, uh, depends on, on, on how we skin this as well, and the different metrics that you look at, but it's a huge number. It's around about three billion to five billion. Uh, that we're actually going to need and we also have to comply with obviously the public uh, the public spending code and deeper guidelines. Uh, I mentioned just there a minute ago as well the role that EPC uh, performance is going to actually, uh, energy performance contracting is going to play in this. Our initial thinking and again we have to go through the pilot process, we're going to be engaging the experts to look at this as well and to do up the business cases and look at the numbers but, but equally our own thoughts are you know EPCs should probably the best route for them is probably kind of in the active systems. So systems that are measurable and quantifiable where you can put a meter on and you can measure the performance. So all of the, you know, your, your, your hot water, your, your heating, your, your lighting, your power, all of those kind of elements. And again, going based on, on, on the, the, the breakdown of costs for a lot of our capital projects that we've delivered to date, the, uh, the active systems account for around about 20 to 25 percent of the overall building cost. So again, if we're to look at it, if we're looking at a figure of three billion to five billion, on the EPC side of things, we we be looking at a figure of around about 750 million to around about a billion. So that's the bit I suppose where we're looking for, if if it's possible to actually bring in the the experts in the in the private market and private market finance. Uh, now again, this was actually touched on, but yeah. This was touched on by, 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 by Liam earlier. Uh, again, what do we do with our new facilities as well? If we're building our new facilities to Part L compliance, building regulation compliance today, this is what our capital plan looks like over the next number of years. We're going to be adding 2,600 new beds into the system, 54, uh, uh, 54 new older person units and primary care units. We're adding carbon the whole time. We're, we're adding. So instead of our target of 65 kilotons that we have to do by our own actions, we're going to add an extra 35 kilotons to that target and now our target becomes 100 kilotons and our challenge just becomes far more, far greater. So what do we need to do is we need to make sure that all of these are designed to net carbon zero ready. And that really implements, we're implementing a number of work streams here. The first is we've upgraded our scope of services. So when we're engaging design teams, they have to design to net carbon zero or net carbon zero ready to develop a roadmap as part of their, their stage reports that they issue to us. They have to incorporate energy, incorporate energy efficient design. I've worked on a number of projects and we're able to generate just through good design practices, 25% energy savings over and above Part L compliance. So again, this becomes one of the key drivers. And the other key driver then is dynamic simulation modeling to test and verify all of our design solutions at design stage, at stage one, stage 2A, stage 2B. So again, you know, we can look at really sweating the building fabric when we're actually doing our designs. Uh, the overall, just as a, as a, a figure there, we were approximately around about three million uh, meters squared of floor area, and we're going to be adding 0 0.8 me, uh, million meters squared of floor area over the next number of years. So it's hugely, hugely important that this is where we target our building design. Um, the next is just on our uh, existing facilities. 
uh, or sorry, on, on the Energy Bureau. And uh, it was touched on kind of earlier, we've got energy officers across all of our regional offices. They're really looking at the behavioral change uh, and the, the low cost, no cost kind of, kind of items, but also as well as establishing green teams and supporting the hospitals and significant energy users in establishing green teams. We've got green teams set up in 90 of our hospitals out of the, uh, the 150 significant energy users. So we're targeting our significant energy users. And equally then, you know, the shallow retrofit projects that we're actually going to be doing there, which is mainly the light, pumps, heat pumps, renewable technology, PVs, all of those kind of items. And we have to make sure that all of our uh, uh, shallow retrofit projects are on this pathway to net zero carbon. Uh, I, there's a bit of a typo here, sorry, for our uh, minor capital and our, our ROO kind of projects, shallow retrofit projects. The investment that we're, we're going to be putting in over the next two years is 60 million. Sorry, that doesn't... I, I made a mistake there at 120, and that's co-funded with, with, with SEAI as well. And uh, I think just the, the last couple of slides, then it'll be very quick, Alan, sorry. The, uh, I think there's a proposed kind of open day uh, being run by the uh, AEE kind of later in the year. I think it's, it's, it's uh, uh, hosted by SEI in, I think it's October, tw uh, October of this year. And, uh, and I think that could be a good learning kind of uh, forum as well, where, where people actually come and, and kind of offer kind of different technologies that can be actually be utilized. The HSE would be open to establish a trial program uh, of technologies that people want to actually br bring forward there. Um, and uh, I suppose, but again, all of this t and technologies that we'd be looking at have to be done in the context that they're not going to actually impact on the delivery of, 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 uh, of healthcare services. They're not going to have an impact on kind of like Legionella control or anything like that. And if anybody has anything that they want to send through to the HSE for our consideration ahead of this kind of workshop, you can email the climate action at hse.ie uh, kind of email address. Sorry, I was just standing up there, John, to stretch my legs. <laughs> um, thanks so much. I, and I'm always impressed. Um, like I, I'm dealing with the HSE 10 years and a bigger bunch of people that want to do stuff and get on with it. Um, it's amazing. And they've come from doing the odd project here, there, and, uh, and doing a few grants to actually leading the pack in terms of planning for 2030. So um, we'll pause there now if there's any questions uh, from anybody, including Michael. I, I assume you're still online. Again, if you want to come to the mic and ask your question, just give your name. Yeah, Damien. Yeah, uh, Damien McAvoy, the Defence Forces. Just uh, the last point, John, there, I think you said you had 90 green teams set up. The challenge we find with setting up an energy team is that they're double-hatted. So it's an existing appointment holder that also has um, a role in energy and it's about sort of um, trying to identify the priorities there. Are those green team members, is that their sole remit or do they have other appointments? This one, yeah. uh, no, it's not, their, it's not their sole appointment but I think it's one of, the, um, one of the key things that we've done then is that there is an energy officer in each of the regions. So the energy officer is there to support the green teams. Um, so, and they'll provide assistance and they do a lot of the heavy lifting as well. But it is important that the kind of the green teams that are set up, they're made up for people in the hospital, that it's clinical people, that it's technical services, but it's also financial people as well. Uh, and, and it's people that have their, 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 uh, their foot kind of in, in a couple of different doors as well. So, you know, if there's an accountant, the accountant can then unlock kind of finance as well. The clinical people bring their kind of uh, expertise to it as well and also the TSDs. But again, the energy officers are there and they've been set up and it's strategic that they're the ones that are supporting, setting up the green teams, but they're also there to support them on an ongoing basis. They go to all of the meetings and, and in some instances as well, the uh, energy officers chair those meetings as well, if they're requested to by you know, the, the, the hospital or the various people within the hospital. The responsibility lays kind of with, with, with the hospital, but the energy officers are there to support in any way they can. And if they, if they need to lead out, they, they lead out in some instances. The, and the energy officers are full-time yeah. energy. Yeah, yeah. And, and they started off 50-50 funded by with SEI through the Pathfinder, and now they're, you've taken them on full, yeah. uh, hired them all. Um, and there's a case study in this year's report of, I think it's Kappa, and um, the, there's, there's a doctor in there that's, 
evangelical about it. And, you know, you, you, you get some very passionate people, nurses, doctors, administrative staff. It's amazing how they get on board. And, uh, but the officers are key to, energy officers are key to keeping momentum. Next. How you doing? Hello. Hi, uh, Stephen Howland. Just a question for the schools and really any buildings that are being retrofitted, say, to an A racing or B racing. How is the issue of lack of information on existing buildings being um, kind of overcome? Because even if you have a school that was, say, built two years ago, if you go back today to the school to try to get the information to do initial BER and then, say, to put in new heat pumps and stuff, there isn't always, say, in the o &M manuals, the details on the windows that's acceptable by SEAI. So the windows might have been 1.4 but it might have to be defaulted to 1.8 or 2, which means your initial building, say, initially should be a B1 or an A3, but because of the lack of appropriate default or appropriate information, defaults it back to a B3, a B3 rating or C rating. Thanks for that. And, and Michael, I know you're just recently in the department. Do you, do you want to have a go at that, or, or, or maybe Orla might have a perspective? Michael. Yes, just for the Pathfinder projects, we're actually doing quite detailed BERs on them. So say, for example, we were doing a pressure test on them pre-works uh, to actually see what the air, the, the air infiltration is and what level of infiltration do need to go on it. We also have, um, we, we have technical support on the Pathfinder program where who that person is actually checking uh, the pre-BERs to see if the correct data is used or see if they could use more appropriate data so that we get a, a proper flavor. But yes, unfortunately, we, the, we don't always have access to the, the full information and we do have to go with defaults. Um, and the defaults are there for a reason as well to actually allow people to publish them because otherwise you wouldn't be able to publish the BER without the defaults. So there's, you know, we have to make compromises in places. Yeah, sco schools are, uh, they're just that particularly hard one. I know in the early stages of the Pathfinder, we tried putting in energy auditors to audit and come up with that information, and we had to skip that step because um, go straight to design. That was the learning of the, the, the latest Pathfinders. You just have to get the M&E people in there who can interpret stuff and put on those theoretical values or make interpretations. Next question. Yes, please. Um, it sounds like you're collecting vast amounts of data on the interventions, the cost of the interventions, the outcomes of the interventions, and it's been at least part, public, part publicly funded. So is, is all of that data made available uh, for people to learn from in the private sector and elsewhere as well? Yeah, good question. From my perspective of monitoring reporting, um, there is pri there, the performance of all the public bodies is made public on a public facing portal every year. Um, and their energy usage, etc. Uh, and over time, we hope to publish more of that data, even down to building level. If the building register gets kicks off, and we get the stage where there's uh, theoretical information and actual consumption and what is good and bad and what's performing well. That's the long-term plan. So that's organizational, and that's their performance uh, through SEI reported to us. But on the, pa on the project side, 
there's also data being collected and, and uh, y you, you will be publishing more on that as well. Yeah, so like we started last year, it was towards December, it was November, December last year that we started to publish some of those case studies. So if you go on to the website, you'll see, I think we have three or four of the school case studies up there already, like two of them were from last year where we put in heat pumps. And again, we're, we're trying to do it, uh, the engineer in me has, has uh, tried to bring in more of the technical side of it, as in to give the real details behind what was done. And uh, so th like th th and if you have any feedback on the case studies or if you want more information, the idea is that you share this information and that people learn from it. So if there's other things that you want to learn from them or that you need, that is missing from the websites for us, please reach out and, and we'll try to update it. Yeah, on our side, we hope to be able to provide that you can go in and see. Eventually, you get to the stage where you get real, real data. John, do you have plans to um, make your the performance of your buildings, the data that you're reading public, or just keep it in-house? Um, Putting you on the spot a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure at the moment. I, um, I, I'd imagine it, 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 I'd imagine it would probably be public, because at the moment, we, uh, we, we have to submit all of our energy data to ourselves as part of the M&R. So yeah. a lot of the, the, uh, the information... Can you hear? You can hear? Yeah. We, we publish, uh, we, 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 we submit the information to SEI as part of the m &R. Mm. so I think that information is out there. Uh, I think when it gets down to kind of a more granular level, kind of on, on site by site, um, I, I think probably, we, yeah, I think we'll probably have to, to look into that, but I, I'd say like that information will be there by the time we, uh, when we've completed our, uh, our, our, our work with IBM, so hopefully it will. But yeah. I, but I'm, I'm just, sorry, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, and I know, I know in, um, in the future when we start communicating decarbonisation and mm. we need to think of clever ways rather than just the graphs that the engineers, they, we look at graphs and we go, wow, look at that, it's brilliant. But when you're start talking to the non-technical or uh, and schools and, and teachers, we need to think of more clever ways of explaining you're performing good or you're performing bad, you need to do something. And I see Charlie Mitchell down the back laughing, he's doing stuff in, in Longford West Media TV. Early, you, you wanted to... Yeah, the other thing I, sh uh, I should have mentioned as well is we've linked in with our colleagues in the R&D uh, program. And last year, we had a uh, as part of the call, we have actually asked for um, a couple of research <coughs> projects around the Pathfinders. So one of them was ar around measuring the indoor environmental quality around these buildings that are retrofitted. So they're actually, I, I know a couple of them have been successful and uh, are going to be going forward this year. So we're linking in with them as well. So I know NUIG are doing one on, on internal environment around the retrofit of these buildings. So they'll all be linked in as well as part of that. Yeah, so hu huge plans to gather more data to use for planning a project and organizational level and eventually publish it. But I do think we need to start publishing more practices because that will really push action on the ground when people see cleverly communicated. Any more questions? Yeah, Charlie, do you want to come to the mic? And uh, we're under no obligation to leave or anything. We'll just keep going <laughs> <laughs> until until you have finished questions. So thanks, thanks Alan. It um, it always sounds great as the saying goes until you start looking at the detail. Could could you just explain to me in terms of the billing register how you're going to deal with the fact that multiple buildings of different age profiles and different loads of different fabrics and whatever else on the same MPRM might be built? Yeah, yeah. So uh, at the moment, if um, for some universities there might only be one meter for the whole campus and uh, the building register will show that one meter and uh, you will be able to set, uh, if Cahill's in the audience, you will be able to set percentages allocation to that uh, at the moment but the ambition will be through future phases that you'll be able to sub-meter and send those readings into us and we display them back for you to save you on, on metering. Now at the end of the day we're, we're trying to monitor compliance so we're not a monitoring and targeting organisation and we're not geared up for that and the resources that that will take. Um, like from talking to the OPW, they tell me it's a huge amount of effort. And I know for myself, my energy management days, it takes a huge amount of effort to run those systems. So we need to decide where compliance ends and energy management and data coming back starts and what's our role within that. And um, if we can add value, we will. But I think it's much better that the HSE, especially the larger companies, take that on themselves and own their monitoring and targeting. So um, it's kind of a watch this space. Um, Charlie, as to how we develop, we'll see how that goes. We want to track all the building data first for uh, compliance and pathfinder analysis and planning towards 2030. And then um, we'll work with the likes of yourselves to see how we can 
put more data, how we can be of added value from an energy management um, perspective, submetering, finding biggest loads, um, you know, graphs, analysis as to what's going wrong, exception reports, etc. Any more questions? People just got a bit of shock there when they heard he's going to keep going until <laughs> stop asking questions. Okay. All right then. Oh, one. Yeah. Do you want to do you just get up to the mic there? Sorry, do you mind it? It's um, so Mike, they can hear you. No, just wanted to know about the presentations that were made today, and will they be available? Yes. They yeah, available? yeah. I think that's the plan. I, I, yeah, I think it is. Yeah, and the recording of the session, so you can watch it back. Good TV. It'll be on Netflix. Okay. Um, any more? Okay, thanks so much for your participation, everybody, and hope you got one good thing out of it that you can take home and use. Safe home.